We're back to normal video shoots after a long CES this time, and we have some leftover news from CES along with other industry goings on in the last week, including a CPU cooler for Threadripper and AM4 that's called the Fryzen cooler. So uh, that's a name. But we're going to be talking about that, uh, Hades Canyon, some other stuff, Meltdown, my scathing review of Google Fiber that we just posted on the website, and a bit more. Before that, this video is brought to you by Thermal Grizzly, makers of the Conductonaut liquid metal that we recently used to drop 20 degrees off of our coffee lake temperatures. Thermal Grizzly also makes traditional thermal compounds for use on top of the IHS, like Cryonaut and Hydronaut pastes. Learn more at the link below. Starting with some quick site news and information on articles we've published in the last week. For those of you who have ordered the GN mod mat, the anti-static mod mat, or are planning to pre-order one, the pre-orders should start shipping pretty soon. We have them on the way to us. That'll be about 10 to 12 days from filming, and then they'll leave from us immediately and go out to all of you. So you should be getting them pretty soon. It'll just be going out by normal shipping. So depending on what country you're in, the arrival time will vary. But they're almost here, so that's pretty exciting. Uh, as far as other articles on the site, we just published something on Google Fiber and our experience with them thus far. They are presently challenging AT&T and Spectrum, aka Time Warner, on who can be the most incompetent, and God Emperor Google and their thaumaturges have bestowed upon us their magical boxes that they call Fancy Fancy Tech Speak, aka a network box, uh, that we're just we're waiting on them to, to sort that out and get it all working. It's been a lot of fun for the last five months, though, because I think we signed up for Fiber Service after they finished the street install in August, and we had a meeting with them in November to finalize everything. That didn't happen. And then another one, that didn't happen. Uh, so we're still waiting on Fiber several months later, even though it's already in the street. So if, if you're interested in reading about that experience, it's on the website. And fun fact, after publishing that, tweeting it at Google, and making some noise about it publicly, finally we're getting service. So apparently the trick is the same as it is with AT&T and Time Warner. It's that if you can make enough noise and you have some following on social media, good news, they'll help you out. If not, and you're a small time customer individual, then uh, screw off, we don't wanna help you. So yeah, not a, not a great experience with Google Fiber thus far. Uh, they are not proving to be any better than any of the other ISPs, though hopefully the network speeds will make up for the incompetence, but we'll see. It'll also come down to the sort of uh, the question you run into of, how much control do I really want Google to have over my life? You've got YouTube, AdSense, the world's largest search engine that drives all of your web traffic, uh, and then phone, if you have an Android phone, and internet. So it's getting to a point where 80% of my existence is under Google's domain if I start moving to their internet as well. So it is starting to get to a, to a point where it's just introspective, like maybe, maybe Time Warner is not so bad. They suck, their internet sucks, but you know, they told me they'd be here between 6 a.m. and 8 p.m. and damn it, they were here between 6 a.m. and 8 p.m. and they installed the service and then I never had to talk to them again. And it's been great for five years, uh, except for the slow internet, but it, it works and it's reliably bad. So it's there, it's reliable. I know what to expect. Uh, I don't over expect anything because they've conditioned me to expect nothing good of them. So, it, it, you know, it's maybe not such a bad idea to just stick with them. But anyway, that article's on the, on the website if you want to read more. Gave me an opportunity to vent with some cre creative writing that I don't normally get to use uh, as I do with ISPs. Also, we published a keyboard review, the Cherry MX 6.0. If you're interested in that, Michael Kern's review is on the website, and he talks about his feelings with that pretty high-end keyboard as well. As far as official news from the show and other hangers on, Fryzen Electro is the name of a deep cool cooler. Now, we're not positive if this will ever come to market. It seems they were asking us to basically, to give them feedback on if we thought it was a good idea and ask the viewers and readers to comment. So if, if you like this cooler, make sure you let Deep Cool know so that they can actually bring it to market because uh, CES has a lot of prototypes. But Fryzen is the name of it. That could probably use some work, you know, like frying, Ryzen, I guess, maybe not fully thought through. Uh, Electro, it's a 120 millimeter cooler. It supports Threadripper. It has a full Threadripper coverage plate, so TR4 cold plate. 
And it claims to also support AM4, which makes sense as long as it's not colliding with VRMs or anything like that or DRAM or any, any of those other nearby components. It should be fine. Full coverage, six heat pipes. Uh, apparently it clears RAM vertically, so that shouldn't be an issue. And it also has an exclusive metal fan frame, uh, which is just a, a metal X over the fan, I guess, that bumps on to the, uh, the top of the cold plate for service area. So that's the MF120 GT fan on the Fryzen Electro Cooler. Let them know if you're interested. Might not ever come to market, but uh, it was interesting at least because Threadford coolers are kind of interesting given their performance difference with cold plate sizes. Another AMD news item, this is a bit newer, and Modus Fuse Drive TM is something that AMD just announced. So I'm going to read what they said in their blog because it actually sums it up pretty well uh, without too much marketing for, for once from any company. And it says, uh, the short of it, Fuse Drive analyzes the storage hardware available on your system from fastest to slowest. So that's DRAM, Crosspoint, NVMe drives, hard drives, all that stuff. And it's supposed to, during setup, create or combine the disks into a single larger disk, uh, which is apparently a bit different from normal caching schemes. So the AMD claims that Fuse Drive lets you use both the SSD and hard drive capacity together as one large boot drive, for example, combining two drives, uh, i.e. a 512 gigabyte SSD and a 512 gigabyte hard drive into one. So it has some parallels to Optane from what we've read. It seems like a, a potential AMD answer to Optane, if anyone needed to answer Optane. And it's a paid solution, so it's $20 for up to 128 gigabyte, I guess, combined drive. We're not fully clear on that yet. And two gigabytes of what they call Fuse RAM, uh, or $60 for one terabyte and four gigabytes of the so-called Fuse RAM. So not fully sure what to think of it yet. We haven't tested it, don't know that we will, but we've gotten a couple emails from you all about it, so we know there's interest. Anyway, uh, Nmodus Fuse Drive, if you want to look it up and see if it's suitable for your system. Other items from CES, be quiet. So they had a new Dark Rock 4 single tower cooler at the show. We didn't get to check out this time, but we'll probably be reviewing it. The Dark Rock 4 is accompanied by the Dark Rock Pro 4, and they are a, a single tower cooler and a dual tower cooler, respectively. The Dark Rock Pro 4 has two fin stacks. It's got two fans, one of which is 135 millimeters, the other is 120 millimeters, and the Dark Rock Non Pro 4 is a 135 millimeter Silent Wings 3 fan, and that's it. Six heat pipes on that one, 200 watt TDP, and apparently now top mounting with two screws, I think. That's my understanding as opposed to the previous awful mounting mechanism of Be Quiet air coolers, it looks like they've, they've actually improved that quite a bit. So that's very good to hear because Be Quiet, we've, we've told them for a long time, they've known for a long time. It's not like we were the first to tell them. They probably figured it out before they shit the things that the mounting mechanism was the absolute worst part of working with a Be Quiet cooler. Now, once it's installed, you're fine, but uh, yeah, so they fixed that, that's great to hear. Meltdown and SSDs. This was a topic we were speaking with Alan Malventano about from PC Perspective. Alan writes some of the best storage reviews in the industry. Uh, he's one of the only sources I trust reading when it comes to storage reviews because storage reviews are actually really hard to do, which is why we don't really do SSD benchmarks. They get, they get complicated fast. So he wrote an article not long ago where he did sort of a, a preliminary test on the change to SSD speeds. He's got a couple things actually. One is specifically testing some meltdown patches versus SSD speeds. And the other one is a white paper that they published and uh, that contains information on SSD performance testing in general, including, for example, large performance swings by updating BIOS. So uh, part of Alan's conclusion in one of his pieces was that simply by updating BIOS, if you're not careful and you're either a storage reviewer or you're running benchmarks on your own, SSDs before and after, be aware that BIOS changes to P states and C states could impact performance more than anything else. So just like any other benchmark, it's really hard to control a lot of stuff. Sometimes if you're updating BIOS, you don't necessarily know what the manufacturer changed. It's possible they changed some power states in there. And if they did, you could see swings from what Alan was saying of up to 20% in performance 
for storage in some specific applications. AS SSD is one of the applications that Alan tested that proved to have some of the biggest swings in performance if you also ran some kind of application that generated a load on the CPU. So it's not a great benchmark for that reason. And he's got a whole white paper that talks about it and also some information on the meltdown testing where for preliminary testing, it looks like it's kind of a wash. There's some, some gain and some loss for performance with the meltdown patches, but uh, it didn't look like a huge deal for what Alan was testing. There are a lot more storage devices out there, a lot more BIOS revisions, so there's always room for change, but it's a, it's a great starting point. If you want to read their white paper, I believe they've got that published publicly as well, and it's definitely worth checking out if you're interested in storage reviews and why they are hard to do right. And we tried storage reviews a while ago, a long time ago when SSDs were pretty new. It was okay then, but now with the way uh, SSDs have a local cache and things like that, uh, they, the, they behave a lot differently with the software used to test. So you get into scenarios where software that's used for benchmarking could flood cache in a way that's really not realistic and may never be encountered by a user. Data looks a lot worse as a result. Uh, so yeah, we haven't gotten back into it, but if you're interested in SSDs, he's a good source for that. Next is, uh, we'll link that down below as well, or in the article accompanying this. Next is the Hades Canyon NUC. So this has been talked about a bit since CES, but we'll, we'll throw our information in as well. There are two models of the Hades Canyon Intel device that was at the show. They are $800 and $1,000. They're expected for first quarter of this year. And they are named NUC 8i7HVK. That's a 100 watt unit uh, or 100 watt TDP anyway and NUC 8i7HNK, which is 65 watts. The HVK is marketed as supporting VR and it's OC ready due to a larger footprint of the cooling solution, and the other one is not. 50% uh, graphics improvement allegedly over the Skull Canyon NUC, and replaceable lid, customizable RGB illumination if that's your thing, front panel RGB LEDs, there's a vase mount, and uh, KB Lake GCPUs, which uh, you get a Vega M GPU with those. So it amounts to a Polaris GPU with HBM2 memory. And we have a specs table on all that that we can keep on the screen for a while if you're curious about the specs for the combined chip. HTC had major Vive news at their CES press conference, primarily announcing the new HTC Vive Pro and Vive Pro Audio and a wireless adapter. The Vive Pro increases display resolution from 2160 by 1200 to 2880 by 1600, and it still uses dual OLED displays. This should help resolve some of the screen door effect problems with VR, particularly when reading text, but we haven't had a great amount of time to try it out yet. Speaking of resolving screen door issues, the Vive should now be seated more appropriately on your face with better weight distribution. This is something we talked with Luke from Linus Tech Tips about in one of our recent videos you can go check out, where uh, the, the weight distribution is a bit better, so it shouldn't pull down quite as much when you're wearing it. That was a big problem for me, especially when using it where uh, during testing, if it dips just a little bit, you can really get a lot of screen door or just blurriness because your eyes don't line up perfectly with the lenses anymore. So some of that should be fixed now. And uh, in addition to that, we tried to talk to Vive engineers. We had two meetings with HTC at CES. Unfortunately, uh, no one there really seemed, or no one we were able to speak to, seemed to have engineering knowledge. So I don't have much more for you on that. But that's the basics of the uh, of the HTC news. And there's also, just quickly, if you missed it, there's a roll-up LG display. This is what you'd call a Halo product. It's just kind of cool. It's a an LG 77-inch transparent OLED, and you can roll OLED TVs like like a tube, like this mat, you just roll it up. Uh, it's slated for launch in two years. We'll see if it happens. It's mostly a thing to get some noise and interest in LG. They were very strict about meetings. It was behind closed doors only and you had to book a meeting. And not only that, the meetings were completely slammed as soon as they announced the product. So uh, really not a, not a shocker there, but we didn't get any footage of it, unfortunately. It is kind of interesting though as a technology. I don't know how applicable it is to any of our users. Asus had portable displays at the show. This is a bit more interesting. We've used these before, some of the older Asus portable displays. You can plug them in via USB and we've used them with laptops or even the old like Zotac portable 
PCs that, uh, that we reviewed ages ago. They're kind of cool because it gives you two screens if you're using a laptop for video editing at a show. It's a very specific use case. But the Zen Screen Go is one of them. It has a four hour battery pack included and a mounting stand. It uses USB Type C, connects to laptops and Android phones, and it works over USB 3 as well. And it's got a 7,800 milliamp hour battery. They also announced the Pro Art 4K. This is another portable display, it's a 4K display. Uh, supposed to be more accurate color, 21.6 inches OLED for the display, two USB type C's and HDR 10, uh, and it weighs 2.2 pounds or about a kilogram. That's the PQ22UC, which, which is kind of interesting for anyone who works a lot and travels. And then Asus also had some laptops. We'll close out with those. So on the topic of Asus, the company also announced its new laptops, including the ROG SKT T1 Hero the ROG G703 and the ZenBook 13. The SKT T1 laptop is a partnership with eSports team SK Telecom T1 and basically is a normal laptop that's co-branded and comes with accessories, including a 120 Hertz IPS display, a GTX 1060 and an Intel i7, making for a combination targeted at mobile gaming. The G703 is a 17.3 inch laptop, 1080p display, 144 Hertz G-Sync panel with an i7 7820HK and a factory overclock to 4.3 gigahertz. A GTX 1080, that's $3,500. And then the ZenBook 13 and Asus X507 are last. These are more consumer targeted laptops that both use MX110 graphics. So not much else to say about them and available first half of 2018. That pretty much wraps up most of the rest of the CES stuff we saw at the show, but didn't get to do a standalone video on. There's plenty of other cool stuff. They're kind of interesting cars there. There were interesting automotive and automation technologies but uh, not really our, our coverage priorities. So uh, as always, you can subscribe for more information. Check out the last 28 or so videos that we made on CES if you're curious about any of that stuff. And we'll have some other roundups and back to normal testing soon. You can go to patreon.com slash gamersnexus to help us out directly if you liked our coverage of the show. Or you can go to store.gamersnexus.net to pick up a shirt like this one or one of our mod mats. Thank you for watching. I'll see you all next time.